Half in the bag. The devil is my hairdo. Hello, boys and girls. Let me tell you a tale and please don't hit stop. It's about two frauds and their VCR repair shop. Fixing VCRs is what they did all day and the names of these fellows were Mike and Jay. Horrible, awful people, some might say, but they are about to learn the magic of Christmas this day. Jesus Christ, why is this so fucking complicated? Okay, thank you. <coughs> oh, Jesus God of... Christ. Ooh. Anal bead disasters in you. A step-by-step -step guide to avoid going to the doctor when you know what happens. Mm. Jeez, what an embarrassing tape to pull out. You think that's embarrassing? I once owned a resale boutique. Oh, oh. Oh my God. Jesus. Oh, I think there's something wrong with your shower. We don't have a shower back there, Mr. Plinkett. Uh, no, that's a septic tank. Huh. Oh, this coffee tastes terrible. We don't have a coffee maker either. That's also the septic tank. Huh. Uh, Mike, we've got to do something about Mr. Plinkett. He's becoming a real nuisance. Mm, yeah. Be nice if we could kick his old ass out on the street. Yeah, fuck this loser. Hmm. Wait a minute. I've got it! Ho, ho, ho. Okay, little boy. What do you want for Christmas? Um, a Lego Batman with wings and this time pants. Mike, I'm certainly not opposed to making money, but we're only charging a dollar. We're not going to make any real money doing this. The mall Santa's charged 10. Ah, therein lies the genius of my plan, Jay. While each child sits there unsuspectingly, it leaves them vulnerable to this. Um, take a basketball. Okay. Oh, that's brilliant. Yes, exactly. Kids lose shit all the time, and no one's going to ask what happened to your wallet. Perfect. And we're now three dollars richer. Would you like a car? A car? Not like a toy one, but, but like an actual car that drives? <laughs> oh, it's just change? Hey, change is money too! I can, I can get you a fake license, I know a guy. Oh, it's a princess crayon. Oh, give me that. Wow, we've made like 50 bucks each. Yeah, the only way to make crazy money like this is to work a half a shift at Taco Bell. And we get to steal from children. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh -huh. <sighs> you know what, Jay, we've been working pretty hard. I think it's time for a break. Yeah, do you want to sit down and talk about the desolation of Smaug? Of course, I would allow of that. Truly, the tales and songs Fall utterly short of your enormity, O oh, Smaug, the stupendous. We are the dwarves of Elabor. We have come to reclaim our homeland. The Hobbit, The Desolation of the Smaug, is the second part of a new trilogy of Middle Earth films from the original Lord of the Rings director Peter Jackson. In this film, a dwarf named Thorin has to retrieve the Arc Stone from an evil fire-breathing dragon named Smaug. Another dwarf named Keeley is falling for an elf named Kate from Lost. But the archer elf Legolas also has feelings for Kate from Lost. Meanwhile, Gandalf must separate from the pack of dwarfs to figure out the mystery of the necromancer. There's also a hobbit in there somewhere who mostly just stands around and watches things happen. Mike, what did you think of The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug? The Hobbit Part 2 of three of two trilogies. Mm. Uh, I have to figure out where I was in the timeline of things. Uh, Hobbit Part 2, The Desolation of Smaug. Uh, I enjoyed a lot of elements of it. Uh, a lot of it felt overcrowded and confusing and padded and uh, a little too much happening. 
for my tiny pea-sized brain to comprehend. Um, but, you know, I, I would have to say I liked it overall, but there's a lot to discuss. Well, we'll that's start the, from there. that's the key to making a movie feel epic, is just to have lots of things happening. Yeah. And this movie does that. Uh, maybe it's a case of lowered expectations because of the last movie. There's lots of things I liked in the last movie, but there was also lots of things that I found horribly disappointing as a fan of the original Lord of the Rings movies. But I liked this one quite a bit. Uh, a lot more than the last one. Uh, the last one felt like uh, sort of a hodgepodge of ideas, sort of a Frankenstein's monster of different Tolkien writings. It wasn't mm -hmm. just an adaptation of The Hobbit. And this one, it did have a lot of subplots, it had a lot of characters, it had a lot of things going on, but it felt more cohesive than that one did. You can't fault these movies uh, at all for the visuals and the direction and all of the creativity. I love, I love the orcs. They're so cool looking. Yeah, I, I wish there was more. There's still some like guys in costumes in this, but like the main, the what do they call him, like the white orc or whatever. Yeah. He's CG and he has like a henchman that's CG, and they look good. Like the effects are pretty seamless, but I'd prefer a guy in a dumb rubber costume. Yeah, I, I have to say this was the first uh, Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings esque movie where kind of the first half felt like it was starting to look cheap. Mm. Which is a big statement because his <laughs> movies always look great. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and where some of the visual effects were starting to kind of like, oh, you know, and then it's like, da, na, 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 and then it cuts to it like a set. And mm. I'm like, that's a set. Before it was like everything blended so beautifully and perfectly where it went from one landscape to a set. And you didn't really notice. And this one was like, oh, that's a set. And that's a set. But then the ending really makes up for it. I think they're, they saved all their money for the ending. Mm. And then I that, think that's the case with Peter Jackson, where it's like he tries to do so much, but he has the limitations of time. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to release this movie in fucking December. Finish it. So then some of the effects get rushed. <laughs> All of his movies have one or two, at least one or two instances of really shitty looking effects. I read a book uh, a long time ago called The Hobbit, and fuck if I remember what happened in it. Ho Hobo Baggins <laughs> went in the caves. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a thing called Gollum, and he wants his ring. And I don't even remember the dragon in the book. Don't forget, you, you forgot about Smaug? I, I know. We, we uh, watched a cartoon. We watched version. the Rankin Bass cartoon yeah. last year. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of remember this. And then it's like in this, there's all this other stuff going on. And uh, they added new characters, and it's like, does this movie have to be two hours and 48 minutes long? Like, yeah. by the time we get to Smerug, I'm, 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 uh, I'm in a coma. <laughs> I'm, the, the processing, sensory processing of the human brain is being tested with movies nowadays. Mm. It's at the mm. two hour and 40 minute mark, I was like, Oh God, is that guy gonna try to shoot the arrow at the dragon still? Yeah, is that still gonna happen? We've been watching this movie for eight hours. Yeah, and we really could have, you know, cut out a lot of other stuff. The, the stuff I found the most interesting, I, I actually liked the little little love triangle plot. Gasp! Really? Yeah! That's that was, a, as I was watching it, when that happened, when they started introducing that, because I know Kate from Lost is not a character, that's a completely made up character for yeah. the movies, and they, they established on. that there's gonna be some sort of like love triangle, and I was like, really, are we gonna do this now? But you know, like... There's so much shit going on. Get that out of here. Well, that's the thing, though, that had uh, uh, emotion, an emotional connection for me. I, I don't care about getting the Ark Stone. Like, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, there's this like, this, like, ever-present looming threat of the eye and this big... Yeah. You feel this, this tension happening, and they kind of add that in this with... Gandalf running around, this, the evil is coming. And right. They're, they're saying things like that. And, and in this, like, I, I am not invested in the, what, what's his name, the Oakenshield? His, oh, Thorin Oakenshield. His plot, I'm not really that invested in it. Um, Bilbo Baggins is underused in this movie. Um, I like him in these movies. I yeah, just wish no. he was the main character in the movies called The Hobbit. Yeah, he, he's a really good actor. He has, he's really good. Like all the subtleties in his performance are, are are really good, and and I wish they used him more. I think in in the cartoon version, and probably the Hobbit too, as we discussed before, the the great Smaug, the great dragon, is killed by some guy. Just some guy shows up in town town lake. It's not Bilbo. It's not any of the dwarves. J.R.R. Tolkien was like he didn't he didn't care about like Hollywood 
build-ups and plots. He's just like, ah, hey, some guy kills a dragon. What an asshole. And it's like, no, 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 it has to be epic conclusion. <laughs> it has to be uh, Bilbo hanging on the dragon's neck with, with the black arrow going, dun, dun, dun. You know, it has to, you know, he's just like, whatever. So then, they, uh, and they take that guy, and we could be all wrong about this. It's probably in compendiums and uh, uh, anthologies of somewhere else. I don't know. <laughs> but they take that guy. Um, his name's some guy. In this movie, they his give him His name is Bard. His name is the Bard. Yeah, Bard. It's Shakespeare. William Shakespeare shows up in this movie. No. So then he, he helps the dwarves. I don't remember them being in a fish barrels, like as being snuck into the town and all that. Did that happen? <laughs> they may. My memory is very vague. But there's a plot with him, and he's got a family, and he's, he's the descendant of the guy who tried to shoot the dragon at some point, which is kind of Hollywoodish, and it's... But um, it's something. It's something. And... But there's like, like all those plot lines are intersecting, and the dwarves are fun. And but I'm just kind of like bored. I, li I like I, I like Gandalf when he does his little adventures, and he's doing the stuff, and that's those are nice little touches. Yeah. But then the rest of it's just like uh, like slugging through confusion, trying to trying to put all the pieces together as they're happening. Yeah, yeah. It's not like it's the movie's incoherent. It's just that no. there's a lot to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Lots of characters, and a lot of them are sort of underutilized, underwritten. Like, yeah. I couldn't tell you the names of half of those dwarves. No. There's the fat one, there's the the tough one, Yeah. and then there's the other ones. There's those dopey, sleepy... Meeny, meeny, miny, and mo, whatever. and killy, yeah. and, and tilly. Well, I think one of our biggest problems, both of us, with the last movie was the, the overdone 45-minute uh, action sequences that went on and on and got completely ridiculous. And this movie scales that back a little bit. There's lots of uh, expository scenes in this movie. There's lots of character scenes in this movie. Uh, but there is some big action scenes, and one of them that we were right on the money about was the barrel sequence. Remind us of how the barrel sequence originally was done. Oh, they, they hide in little barrels so they can get out of the city. They go down the, the, the little river and then they escape. And that's the scene. <laughs> the, the, there, were no, there was no subplot about orcs trying to kill them. Yeah, them. there's not orcs trying to kill them. There's not the, the elves trying to stop them from leaving. And, but this one, it's like uh, they get in the barrels. I, I should say, I actually found the sequence a lot more fun than I was expecting. I, I enjoyed it a lot, Because I was too, waiting yeah. for it to happen, and I was waiting to be bored by it. Mm -hmm. But it was it was goofy, it was weird, it was kind of dumb, but there was some creativity going on. Yeah. Uh, Peter Jackson reintroduced something that was in the uh, Lord of the Rings movies that I love a lot, which is uh, tons and tons of decapitations. Mm. But yeah, they get in their little barrels, and they go, and, and it's kind of fun because they get to the... The, the edge of the elf city and the elves close the gates so they can't get out and then they have to turn the lever to get out but then it just keeps going and they're going down waterfalls and they're jumping in and out of barrels and there's yeah. elves shooting arrows and it's just complete nonsense. Yeah, it, it becomes a little cartoony. Mm -hmm. Legolas can now do anything. Yes. He's like Spider-Man. Him, um, him and the, uh, Kate from Lost both, I guess. Yeah, they're both so Been good at what they're doing, it, it, almost to the point of cartooniness. But yeah, there, there was one part where one of the uh, dwarves in the barrel jumps out of the thing and it rolls along. and it's, it, it, I actually like that sequence a lot. Yeah, there's lots of little fun touches in it that kind of kept my interest, despite how silly it was and the fact that it didn't advance anything in the movie. There is no king under the mountain, nor will there ever be. It will not end here. With every victory, this evil will grow. Legolas has grown very fond of you. Do not give him hope where there is none. So, for a movie called The Hobbit, the character of The Hobbit uh, is barely in it for most of the movie. The movie was called The Hobbit? It was called The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Oh my god, I thought we were watching Last Vegas. Uh, I'm okay with the lack of hobbitness in this. He was he was on a mission to do his thing. Um, he had he had a couple nice scenes in it. Uh, I, I I like the universe. I like the the mythology and all the the, the grand grandness of everything. Swisher was a little less overstuffed with things happening. Yeah, mainly, mainly subplots because, yeah, it's this big grand universe. There's lots of characters. There's lots of villages and, and 
you know, there's dwarves and elves and all that stuff, and it all feels really lived in. Yeah. But yeah, a little more focused storytelling wise would be would be helpful. Yeah. Because when it does get back to the Hobbit, like it's kind of like the first movie. The the best sequence in that movie was the extended scene between Bilbo and Gollum. Yeah. And in this movie, the best sequence is the sequence between Bilbo and Smaug. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably too long because Peter Jackson loves all this stuff, but mm -hmm. it's really good. It's really well acted from both uh, Morgan Freeman and Smaug. But I, I think the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, the, uh, the Frodo adventures, um, I think that had a good, like, we're seeing this world through the eyes of a hobbit because it starts off in the Shire and then you know, yeah. they go along on their adventure and um, there it's focused on them. And this, it's like, yes, he's in it, but there's all these other big things happening and there's less material to make these big movies out of. The Lord of the Rings books obviously are huge. Hobbit is not so much, so it's putting patchwork in everywhere. And I think that's where it just starts to become a little, little messy. Um, yeah, I, I think it's less messy than the first movie, though. This one, it felt like things were connecting in a way that the first one yeah. didn't. It was like, oh, here we're adapting The Hobbit, and then we're off on some other thing, and then we come yeah. back to The Hobbit. This one, it, it feels like it's, it's all going to connect. I think it's good that Peter Jackson loves this universe uh, and, and wants to make these big, big movies uh, because there are a lot of people out there that love them. They love all the detail. They love that he grabbed this from this source and put it in there and made it work. And, and that is great. I would love Star Trek movies to be like that. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's a matter of taste. But when you're playing it for just, you know, Joe Schmo in the audience, some things you got to pull out and tighten up and yeah. make a little more uh, connections with, uh, you know, these movies will be around forever and Lord of the Rings fans can sit there and dissect them. It, it, it kind of felt like we were watching the director's cut, like the, the four-hour-long extended edition. Yeah. It's like, Wah. Which there will be for this it's one. It's like, I want to see uh, Bilbo Baggins go on a little adventure and then s them go on a barrel run and then get some orcs come and then he, oh, he's got to confront the dragon now. I'm like, oh, this is right the point, hit the points right and, uh, and get it in under 90 minutes. I'd be very, very curious to see when the third movie comes out, someone to make uh, a fan edit that turns them into just an adaptation of The Hobbit. And it's like two hours long at most. Yeah. I, I would love to see that. It's entirely possible, <laughs> I guess. It's the exact opposite reaction I had to the Lord of the Rings movies, where when I heard about the extended cuts, like when that was first coming out, I was like, oh, I want to see more of this. Mm -hmm. With these, the Hobbit movies, I want to see less of them. Middle Earth is back at Denny's with the Build Your Own Hobbit Slam. 20 delicious options like sweet potato pecan pancakes, hearty breakfast sausage, and honey cake French toast. A meal to satisfy the hungriest of hobbits. See The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Well, just like the original Lord of the Rings trilogy and this new Hobbit trilogy, the best performance comes from a completely CGI character. Mm-hmm. Well, in the original movies and now Smaug in this one. Yes. Let's talk about Smoog. Smoog. I missed the Gollum. Uh, it would have been nice to see him appear in this. Uh, even a cameo, which they didn't even feel the need to do. I, I, I think that restraint is good. Yeah. Was, <laughs> At I least found there's that some restraint. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I guess we should say spoilers because we'll probably talk about how this film ends. Okay, yeah, so Smog is good in the movie. Uh, we're gonna get into spoilers about the ending in Smog. Uh, skip to this time code to avoid. There's a double-edged sword with this Smog character because you're like, that's it. That's the worst creature in, in Middle Earth. The one to be most terrified of. And it's, it's built up so much and he gets there and it's like, oh, there it is. You know, you see his eye and, and, you and then dragons are super smart too. A lot of people don't know that. 
Um, they're highly intelligent, and uh, you're, you're, you're scared, you know? And, and then their exchanges and uh, the, the things that happen, it's, it's very well done, it's very tense, and you're really interested, other than a lot of the other sequences in the film where, like, I'm just, my eyes are blurring because everyone's going, sure. But the smog scene's done very well. And then it goes on a little too long, and then the, the, the grandness of Smaug starts to diminish a little when wacky hijinks uh, trick him. They're dancing on his, on his mouth. And, uh, and then it it's just becomes um, another big dumb action sequence instead of restraint. Yeah. Because you mentioned restraint. You know, Smog looks good. He's got a lot of weight to his movements. And you can tell that the, the scenes between him and Bilbo where they're just talking are probably the closest direct adaptations from the original. Mm -hmm. Because like the dialogue and stuff, it all kind of has a different sound and feel to it than the rest of the movie. Uh, similar to the Gollum scene in the first Hobbit movie. Yeah. Where it's like, you made this movie because you wanted to do this scene. Yes. Like this is something you love from the books, and that's very obvious. But yeah, then the other the other little dwarfs show up, and they all start fighting smog, and they're going down uh, caverns on ropes or on chains or whatever. And there's like a pulley system, and and yeah, that's where it becomes like. Okay. The, the same scene happened in the previous film in the Goblin Kingdom, right? It was very similar, yeah, where like they're on like platforms and, and going around, yeah. and it's like this isn't what's interesting. What's interesting is the the uh, the, the dynamic going on between the two characters and them sort of like Bilbo trying to outwit him. Yeah, I would have been very happy with um, th that kind of scene, and then Smaug threaten makes threats and then decides to leave and go attack the town, and that's all we needed. Mm -hmm. But they, they had to give the, all the dwarves something to do, and they, it kind of became, it reminded me of the Attack of the Clones conveyor uh, belt scene. Yeah, Where yeah. it's like, um, all the, I know this dragon's going out and going to attack the town. I know that's what's eventually going to happen. So yeah. all this other stuff becomes superfluous and pointless. Well, I, I think the reason they added all that stuff is because without it, this movie would feel even more anticlimactic. Yeah. Um, which is something we should point out. Uh, like, I know this is the second part of a trilogy, but it's still, you, you know it's not going to be the conclusion to a whole story, but it still felt like, I noticed in the theater, like everyone was like, oh, I guess it's over. You know, it, it yeah. really felt more anticlimactic than any... There's, there has to be some sort of satisfying conclusion as its own movie, but still make you interested in seeing the next one. Yeah. And this one was like, oh, they tried a thing, they thought they killed the dragon, they didn't, and now I guess the movie's done. Okay, let's, let's set the record straight here. Okay. These movies are great. Yes. Uh, they're ambitious, they're well-made, they're good. Yeah. I, I don't want to give the wrong impression, um, but you and I are we're translating and we're, we're interpreters for movie-going audiences. There are two, two audiences for this movie. There's, there's Joe, audience member, and Lord of the Rings fans. Yes. And Peter Jackson is a Lord of the Rings fan. He, he's a filmmaker and a storyteller, but at the same time, he can overindulge in all this uh, wizardry nonsense. Uh, it's, uh, is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? Yes. Well, speaking of general audiences, uh, I was thinking about this while watching the movie. Do you remember a high frame rate? Do you remember 48 frames per second when that was going to be a I, thing? I, I do. I, I do remember this. I was thinking that in, in terms of general audiences because there's uh, the people that just go to watch a movie. They might say, oh, the movie starts at this time. And then they get there and they say, oh, it's in 3D. It's in 48 frames. Okay, whatever. They put on their glasses and they just watch the movie. And they have no understanding of the fact that something is different or weird about it. Yeah. It's the same people that have HD TVs and have that uh, like motion smooth thing on it, and they don't even notice it, like because they're just watching things and they don't yes. they don't look at it that way. People that are really into film apparently did not like the high frame rate. Uh, it got a lot of controversy when it first came out, and now no one talks about it at all. Well, that's the thing with this movie. We had three different options. Mm. We had 2D. Uh, 3D and 3D high frame rate. That's still, that's a thing. And I guess that's a Peter Jackson thing he wants to do. Yeah. But we saw it in wonderfully dark theater, very big screen, 2D presentation. Looked great, sounded great. Mm -hmm. I was completely happy yes. with that. I did not dim the picture with the damn 3D glasses. And uh, we did not have to see uh, the dwarf TV show. <laughs> um, so I, I don't get it, and you're right. Um, general audiences 
probably they, they understand what 3D is. Right. I would guess one out of a million understands what high frame rate is. Yeah. And 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 would even notice it. And that's the sad part is is that why why push it if people don't notice it? Well, that ties in with something that during the barrel sequence in this movie, there's a couple shots. Mm. It was very weird. Uh, that looked like they were shot on like a GoPro or something. It was supposed to be like the barrel's point of view, yeah. I guess. And it was looked like like cheap pixelated video. Yeah. And it was just a couple quick shots. And I, I even looked over at yeah. you. I was like, what was that? We both noticed it. It yeah. was really weird. And that's something I don't think a general audience would even notice. They yeah. would just see the, the water crashing into the rocks yeah. and stuff. But that was like, why is that in there for one second? Yeah, I, unless it's like we can't strap a red camera to a barrel. Let's strap this lesser end uh, HD camera and hope I, I it looks the same yeah. when it's blown up to that size. And that might have been the case. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But I mean, I'm all I'm all for experimentation in these mainstream movies. That's why I like Crank Two. It looks like a, yeah. like a cheap skateboard video from the '90s. Um, Crank, but Crank Two, you could shoot your action scenes with a GoPro camera. Exactly, but, but in a big like Lord, Lord of the Rings movies. epic, like why are we watching GoPro footage? You have no right to enter that mountain. I have the only right. We've been blind. In our blindness, our enemy has returned. So, Mike, would you recommend uh, The Hobbit, The Desolation of... Ah, uh, yeah, I would. Okay. Come with an empty bladder. These movies are, are big and epic, and they're worth your price of admission and there's lots of little moments in them. Uh, not overly nerdy, not overly technical. There's emotion, there's action, and there's a big dragon at the end that's worth, worth sitting through the whole movie mm -hmm. to get to. Sure. I would also recommend it. Uh, it, it. You definitely get your money's worth when you go to see a movie like this, but it does feel like you, you've eaten a little too much cake. Mm. Where it's like, oh, that cake was good, but I should, probably should not have eaten the entire thing because now I'm gonna vomit all over myself. And others and potentially others. Step into the light. Well, we've talked about the Hobbit. I guess we should get back to, to dealing with these brats. Yeah. Next. Oh, here comes the next one now. All right, so uh, what do you want? PlayStation, an Xbox? A uh, new bike, one of those Wii's. You want a you want a 60-inch plasma screen TV for your bedroom or something? What? What? I don't want anything like that. So like cash then? Do you want a, a gift card to Starbucks? No, I just want my daddy to find a job. What? He hasn't worked for over a year. It makes him really sad. Oh. I don't know if Santa can can do anything for you. I, oh, it's it's terrible. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. It was then Mike and Jay were confirmed for gay. Inside, they knew that Christmas wasn't about stealing. It was about giving, love, and a heart full of feeling. In fact, the truth is, I must say, that their hearts did grow three times bigger that day. I'm sorry, Mr. Bauman. You now have a condition called cardiomegaly, or enlarged heart syndrome. You'll have to take these medications every day for the rest of your life, or you'll die. What? This is bullshit. Why do I get an enlarged heart and he's just fine? Actually, it was a good thing that Mike was admitted today. He was near death with shrunken heart syndrome. But learning the magical joy of Christmas giving turned his heart back into the perfect normal size. Mike, you're gonna be okay. Wow! So you mean stealing from children and then pretending to care saved my life? Christmas, Christmas is, is magic. magic! Oh, I forgot. There's some more medication you need to take. Oh my god! 